We now continue our series of conversations with Democratic presidential candidates. Steve Bullock is the two-term governor of Montana, and he joins me now. Governor Bullock, thank you for being here. Judy, it's great to be with you. So you are the governor of a state of a little over a million people, very red, very conservative. Donald Trump won it by over 20 points. Why should Democrats support you? Well, I think that, yeah, I'm the only one in this race that actually won in a state where Trump won. He took Montana by 20 points. I won by four. 25 to 30 percent of my voters voted for Donald Trump. If we can't win back some of these places we lost, we're not going to win. And it's also more than that. I mean, even with what is a right now 60 percent Republican legislature, we've been able to demonstrate that you can get meaningful things done that impact people's everyday lives. And people want both the economy and D.C. to work for them. Being outside of Washington, D.C., I think I have a little bit of a different perspective than most folks here. You called yourself progressive, and you have favored things like the earned income tax credit. You were able to expand Medicaid in the state of Montana. But there are other Democrats, like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, who would say the country needs big and bold after Donald Trump. It needs things like the Green New Deal, like Medicare for all. Yeah, and I call myself progressive and believe it because at the core of that word really is progress. We need to be able to make a meaningful difference for people's lives. We can't just talk about the challenges. We have to actually be, first be able to hear Americans and address those challenges. So I want to make sure that as I'm proposing things, it's not like with Medicare for all. I don't discount it because it's like it couldn't get it done necessarily. I do discount it in as much as I don't think that's the best policy solution. And the most progressive solution is to make sure everybody has health care that's affordable. And you can do that without upending what's been about, it took about 70 years to get to where we were when the Affordable Care Act passed. So let's build on that. Let's not just rip it apart. Guns, uh, uppermost in our minds right now, as you know. Your own family's been touched by gun violence. You've talked about your uh, then 11-year-old nephew yeah. being uh, shot to death on a school playground, uh, what, 25 years ago. When you campaigned for re-election in 2016, uh, you were against universal background sure. checks. Now you are for them. Why the change? Things like universal background checks. It's not just Democrats that say they would like this. I mean. NRA members say this makes sense. And as a gun owner, I mean, I'm calling on other gun owners to say, we all want to keep our community safe. We can do it in ways that, with, as an example, universal background checks. But you acknowledge your position changed because, of, because of what you see. Some people are saying President Trump's language, his rhetoric, has contributed to part of what's going on. How do you see it? Yeah, I certainly, in he is. You know, I would never want to put the blood of people all across this country on one person's hands. Um, but for him to say we have to speak with one voice when it comes to speaking out against race, racism and white nationalism and bigotry, when so much of the language that he's used over this last two and a half years has included racism, equivocating on white nationalism and bigotry. So you can't say this just the day after shootings when you haven't lived it for the last two and a half years. I do think that, you know, when tacitly even white nationalists might think, well, this guy, if he equivocates on Char Charlottesville, he has my back. I don't think that helps at all with what we are as a country. Campaign finance. You have been um, waging a legal battle against so-called dark money. Uh, this is money from donors who aren't identified. You recently won a lawsuit against the Trump yes, administration having to do with foreign money, transparency. My question is, without a constitutional amendment to overturn the Supreme Court Citizens United decision, which, as you know, lifted restrictions sure. on corporate uh, political spending, is there a way to keep dark money out of American politics? Oh, uh, I think there absolutely is. Even in Montana, with the two-thirds Republican legislature, we passed a law that said, if you're going to spend in our elections, I don't care if you're a 501c4, I don't care what you call yourself, in the last 90 days, you have to disclose 
all that spending and the contributions. So two other things. You would then support an amendment to, to overturn. I would love to see the 28th Amendment the citizens, passed. Citizens United. Absolutely. So you're fighting dark money, but we know that you are also tonight in Washington scheduled to yeah. attend a closed-door fundraiser uh, with a registered lobbyist as one of the co-hosts, a man named Jay Driscoll. This has been reported by the Center for Public Integrity. He's lobbied 35 or so clients just this year, many of whom give corporate money, yeah. but don't disclose. Yeah, but they certainly don't give corporate money to me. I mean, the fact that we could even be having this conversation is what I want to add is the sunshine of transparency. In as much as many of the presidential candidates now have super PACs, some may even take corporate PAC money. I've said no PACs, no super PACs, all individuals and disclosed completely under, you know, the allowable rules so that we can have this conversation so that one individual helping out a fundraiser certainly isn't going to be influencing my everyday actions. And I think that it's, to me, the more nefarious is the lack of transparency and sunshine. The environment. You don't support the Green New Deal, uh, which critics say is too radical. But if climate is an existential threat, why not do something dramatic? Oh, no, and we do have to take bold and immediate steps. I mean, I'm from the West. Our fire seasons are 48 days longer than what they were about four decades ago. So rejoining Paris, the auto industry didn't even want the removal of these fuel efficiency standards. Investing in technology and research so we can get more renewables onto the grid. We know, you know, the scientists say we have to be carbon neutral, not as a country, but as a world by 2050. I think we could do it by 2040 or even earlier. All right, we will leave it there. Governor Steve Bullock, thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Judy.